One thing I knew when I went to New York that I did not want was a husband. Because to me, that just meant you had to give up all of those things and you know, become a, uh, a homemaker, which I did not want to be. And so I was not looking for love. I was not looking for romance. I was avoiding it like crazy, and I was plenty mad when I saw John Cassavetes, too, because he was the best-looking man I'd ever seen in my life. And I thought, oh, my God. I, had, I got myself all this way to New York, and then he just walks in. I didn't even invite him. Det var här de bodde, på toppen av en av Hollywoods kullar. Och det var också i just det här huset de spelade in många av sina filmer. Jenna Rowlands och John Cassavetes. Deras kärlekshistoria är unik. Och tillsammans så försökte de i sina filmer att undersöka vad kärleken är. Men det var inga glassiga Hollywood-produktioner de gjorde. Nej, tvärtom. Det var lågbudgetfilmer som handlade om verkliga människors liv. Och ibland agerade de tillsammans framför kameran. Hello, how are you? Fine, how are you? Fine, how are you? Fine. It's really you. It really is. The big star pays a little actor a visit. You know what I was thinking about? I was thinking about uh, my life. I was thinking about the opening. I want to get some sleep. Do you love me? I'm going to close this door. Hey, what am I asking? What am I asking? Come on, take a chance. Listen, look, let's take this play. Let's dump it upside down and see if we can't find something human in it. I mean, there has to be more when two people have cared for each other for a long time. Besides, agony. <laughs> Are you with me? I'm not bitter at you. How did you meet? I was in school and at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, and John had gone there a few years before, and he came by to see a performance of Dangerous Corners. And, uh, and he came backstage. That was that. And four months later you were married. Mm. So that was really love at first sight. It really was, yes. John Cassavetes kunde som ingen annan skildra kvinnors känsloliv. Och ingen kunde gestalta det så bra som Jenna Rowlands. Först i En kvinna under påverkan 1974. Och senare i Gloria och i premiärkvällen. When you're in this house, you really see uh, what an influence your professional career has had on you. Can it be difficult to draw a line between this and your private self? We just wanted to do this thing. We wanted a certain way of life. We wanted to, we wanted to get up and really do what we wanted to do that day. Uh, we didn't want to go do something that everyone said we should do, and believe me, Everyone was saying we were doing the wrong thing all of the time. But, but it, was, it was terribly satisfying. And, uh, and, and, and I think of the kids now, um, too. They were always running, you know, every time they stepped out of their, their bedroom, they stepped or tripped over a cable or bumped into a camera or something, so that they were very easy with it. It didn't seem like some... Um, kind of exotic thing that your parents went to the studio and, and they would, didn't feel shut out of it. And I think they were happy with it too. Was it hard uh, to do these films that were so different from the ordinary Hollywood movie? Fairly impossible, yes. <laughs> so <laughs> how did you do? Well, we, we um, had the advantage uh, that in that both of us were actors. And we, we realized right from the beginning, I mean, when when we suggested doing middle of the night and had the script and showed it to uh, the people with money, the studios and stuff, and they, they said, who wants to see a movie about a crazy middle-aged dame? You know, who, what's, what are you talking about? I mean, they were absolutely flabbergasted that you would think that 
that uh, they would want to put their money in that. just do it ourselves. When, I mean, we were not paying anybody $20 million or taking $20 million, nor had we ever, or have I ever seen $20 million in a pile. But um, we, we shot in our home. We shot with friends that we thought were talented. Everybody did everything. Um, uh, it was... Uh, it was thrilling, to tell you the truth. The house was packed with people that you love and, and like to work with all the time. And, you know, every day somebody else would be cooking. And, you know, some would be, it, was, it was a wonderful, exciting kind of time. God, no, I'm so lucky. I can't believe that I, that I was able to luck out and have it work. I mean, to have it work out that, that our marriage worked out and that the children turned out to be happy and that our that we got to put our mothers in our movies, and, and that they were wonderful, <laughs> and they were terrific, and yeah, stole the scene so from us. And, and uh, those are those are good times we're yeah. talking about. Yeah. Grandma, where are you? 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 Well, I'll, everybody in bed. I, I, I'll just sit in there. Come on. Here comes Grandma. Here comes Grandma. Here's Grandma. Hi. All right. Hi, sweetheart. How are all of you? I'm glad to see you. It's a nice family. Well, the American point of view, more or less, has always been that movies are for entertainment and that people go to work and they have problems and they have hard days and they don't want to go through anything else so when they go to a movie. That's, that's a legitimate point of view. It's a point of view. It's just that John and I thought that there didn't have to be just one point of view, you know. There didn't have to just be entertainment. There could be, um, for some of us, it was more satisfying to, uh, to do the kind of pictures that that we did, that tried to examine life, you know, try to figure out a little tiny bit of it, perhaps, uh, and love, uh, the loss of love, or, or the, the gaining of love, or the, what you give up for what. Um, those are subjects that interested us. It always was strange to me that Europeans could accept that, because Europeans have been through so much more than we have. They went through the war, and they went through really hard times. A woman under the influence, you portray uh, a woman who is going crazy. It affected people in such a strong way. Do you understand why? I know for me, too. It took me several months to get that out of my mind. Um, How did you create this portrait, do you remember? The same way that, that uh, you know, it, it's at least my theory that all of us, all of us have the same things within us in some proportion. There's nothing we can't understand about each other. 
if we choose to. It's just a question of letting that part expand over the other qualities, let it get out of proportion, which is what people do. And this, there's nobody that won't recognize that they've done part of it at some time. I think every yeah. mother with a bunch of small kids mm -hmm. can recognize the feeling that you're going crazy because it's just too much. And any woman who has been in love with someone, and uh, even even the very modern young feminists who who uh, don't particularly like the idea of this, but the fact that Mabel, um, she had absolutely no identity for, I wish I could think of a more interesting word, but she saw herself only through the eyes of her husband, only. And this was an extreme case. But everyone who's been in love has at certain times done that, been victim to it, been, you know, every man or woman. And um, I thought that was very interesting. I don't mind you being lunatic. Mm -hmm. Not lunatic. Yeah. I didn't do anything wrong. The manuscript uh, the, that was your husband's, uh, did, you, um, did you discuss it a lot between the two of you? No, not really. Um, It's strange because John would write the the uh, screenplay, and uh, for example, Woman Under the Influence, I don't think we discussed at all. And then, how could he know so much I about have women? No idea. But he did. I have no idea. I have tried to think that his mother was a very complicated, talented, interesting woman. I can see that growing up with her would, would give him a lot of insight. But he, he, um, he just did. He just did understand women, and he liked women. He liked women very much. And um, he, he felt that his own personal feeling was that he didn't know how wo any woman could not be crazy in this society. The way society is set up is specifically to drive women crazy <laughs> in his point of view. How true! Uh, yes, and, uh, <laughs> so he expressed that quite a lot. Mm. But where he got the depth of his understanding, I don't know. So you didn't help him in this. I no, thought no, that you I had taught no, him. No, that would, I, uh, I was the beneficiary of, mm. of uh, his very great talent. struggling mothers today who are trying, you know, to do everything at the same time. And you should know that in Sweden, 
you never have a nanny. The, the, the women do everything themselves. They take care of the kids and they take care of the job. Uh, would, would, do you have any advice? Well, I think that women, every place that I've been, seem we all seem to have that that the curse of thinking that we have to be perfect. Men don't seem to think that. They don't worry about it if they're not perfect. It seems quite normal. And as John said one time, too, he said, uh, men don't teach women this. Their mothers teach them that. He said, men don't expect women to be perfect. It's women who give themselves migraine headaches because they can't be both at this school, the kindergarten, luncheon, and uh, doing something. And John did not in any way expect a woman to conform to, he didn't expect anyone to conform to, to uh, anything that they didn't wish to do. He saw no reason for it. And uh, that was very unusual thinking on a man's part when we were growing up, too. Yeah. But Especially with his Greek background, yes. I think. He was, very, he was a very modern very. man. Very. Yeah. So when, what happened when you had your first child? My first child was Nick, and uh, I had him, and I fell in love. And uh, so then five years later, we had Alexandra, and then five years later, we had Zoe. And nothing happened. I just, just took off the time. And uh, it, 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 it just kind of blended into the whole stream of it. But when you did uh, Woman Under the Influence, I think it was when you just had your third child, was it? No, that would just be, yes, yes, that would be, Zoe was born in 70, so yes. I mean, three kids and being involved in a shooting that took place uh, uh, partly in this house. Oh, I'm not saying it wasn't complicated. I'm not saying it wasn't hard. <laughs> it was very hard. Um, at times, it was enough to drive you to ultimate madness. Um, there's just so many hours in a day and so many balls you can keep in the air. And, and yes. The, and kids that are coming. Sure. Ah. It's, uh, it, it was not, um, it wasn't easy. It was just great. Did you have help with the children? Did Always. You? You had nannies? I am a firm believer, and for every baby there should be, I mean, if you have five children, you should have five nannies. Um, but uh, our babies, you know, <coughs> were very, six years between the first and second, five years between it. Each one was in school by the time the next one was born. This is uh, Zoe, mm -hmm. our youngest daughter. Oh, this is Zan and, and Rick, uh, our second daughter. This is my mom. That's Nick and me, and that's my granddaughter, Veronica, with her dad. And at the beginning, your husband stayed home with the, with the children. We took, he took care of Nick a couple of years, and while I did that, and in that time, he wrote Faces, uh, uh, well, about four of the films that we eventually did, or part of them, or he was never so happy. But he that's said, horrible. I mean, when I've been home with my it. kids, I didn't <laughs> write any, any scripts. It's very discouraging. <laughs> because if you, if you, John could not be stopped from working. He, um, and we did have, we did have a, a lady, too, with us all the time. But he was not a person that had to be urged to work or he had to meet a deadline for work. He was just, he was, he was obsessive the other way. He was a, literally a workaholic. And, but he loved the work so much that it worked out. Was this ever a problem for you that he yes. had? Yes, sure. But, uh, but that particular time was a very happy time, I remember. Because he said, I can't believe this. He said, you're supporting me, and I'm just sitting around doing nothing. I said, what do you mean sitting around doing nothing? You've written about eight screenplays, and, a, and he had, did a novel of husbands. And, he, uh, and, and it was a very nice time for Nick with him. I think that 
That's perhaps why they were so very close. Frick Wilhelm, born 1877, died 1946. Longtime parliamentary leader of the German National Socialist. Oh, screw him. Uh, next is friction. You know what that is, don't you, JJ? Yeah, when you rub something together and it makes sparks. That's right. You're getting too smart for this book already. In Unhook the Stars, uh, the woman reads the encyclopedia for this little boy. Is it true that you did it to, to your children? I didn't think so. When I first saw the, the script, um, I mean, again, you don't recognize yourself sometimes, but I, because I said to Nick, um, you know, you know, son, are you sure he's not a little bit small to be reading all these encyclopedias to? He said, you don't remember that? He said, you did that all the time. Don't you remember? We'd open it and you'd put hands in like that and then we'd start from there. I don't remember it. No? Um, I, I did after he refreshed my memory. And all of the things that uh, he had the little boy and Mildred doing were things that we had done as a child. But children remember those things. And, and uh, it was, it was uh, I was rather touched that he did. You live here in Hollywood, but you uh, never seem to me to be this typical Hollywood uh, actress. You know, I when I was starting out, and this is in New York, I was able to see at rather close hand um, Marilyn Monroe, Judy Garland, a lot of very talented people. I only, that's just two of many. I didn't see any conspicuous happiness. And they had a lot of money and a lot of fame. And uh, those two things were not doing it for a lot of people that I knew. And it struck me when I first got there. I was, I was very struck by it because I thought they'd be all, all very happy and gay and different. But I thought, no, no. There's uh, some kind of pressure working there that is, is uh, not what I want. And I'm sure with all of them it was different, but fame and money are not going to be the things that, that make you happy. Uh, your husband said that love is not constant. When you live together with somebody, uh, you live in a constant change between love and the loss of love. And uh, the only difference is if you choose to leave or if you stay. I don't know. Um, I really don't know. I, I, I can't tell if they, I can never, t it's always when my friends or someone fall in love and get married, you think, how did those two ever get together? And then when I get divorced, you say, how could they get divorced? <laughs> so, so why didn't you? I didn't want to. You never wanted to? Yes. Once, twice a week I wanted to, but I never wanted to enough to want to. <laughs> mm. I wanted to kill him more often than I wanted to divorce him. It, it's such a private thing, love, mm. and such a changing thing. And the, the fact that, that I think it's good to know that it's changing and to know that there are are going to be times when you don't even want to speak to one another, but that that's going, that's going to change too. And uh, uh, but I think I think really wanting the same kind of life, wanting the same thing, is is a very great basis for love. John Casavetes blev bara 59 år. Han dog 1989 efter fem års sjukdom. How do you survive such a loss? I I can't really even begin to answer that. I had him for a long time. The best years in a person's life really. Most creative years. And, and I thank God for it. But, uh, you know, 
you, you don't survive a loss like that. It's, you just get through it. Because, I mean, you lived so intensely with, with each other in, in, in all respects, privately and, and in your work, so the loss must be so much bigger, I gather. I don't know. I don't know how to compare losses with other people. I'll, you know, um, loss is loss. Thousands of things here. Prayer just kind of crammed together, but they, they all mean a lot to me, so I, I don't neaten up, probably. Actually, I have so many more, I could fill even the rest of the house mm -hmm. with them. Do you ever do any parts today that mean as much to you as uh, the parts that you did with uh, John? Oh, nothing will ever mean as much as those did. Nothing will come even close to those. But, uh, but I still enjoy them. Och tillsammans så försökte de i sina filmer att undersöka vad kärleken är. Men det var inga glassiga Hollywood-produktioner de gjorde. Nej, tvärtom. Det var lågbudgetfilmer som handlade om verkliga människors liv. Och ibland agerade de tillsammans framför kameran. Hello, how are you? Fine, how are you? Fine, how are you? Fine. It's really you. It really is. The big star pays the little actor a visit. You know what I was thinking about? I was thinking about uh, my life. I was thinking about the opening. I want to get some sleep. Do you love me? I'm going to close this door. Hey, what am I asking? What am I asking? Come on, take a chance. Listen, look. Let's take this play. Let's dump it upside down and see if we can't find something human in it. I mean, there has to be more when two people have cared for each other for a long time. Besides, agony. <laughs> Are you with me? I'm not bitter at you. How did you meet? I was in school and at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, and John had gone there a few years before, and he came by to see a performance of Dangerous Corners, and, uh, and he came backstage. That was that. And four months later, you were married. Mm. So that was really love at first sight. It really was, yes. <sighs> John Casavetes kunde som ingen annan skildra kvinnors känsloliv. Och ingen kunde gestalta det så bra som Jenna Rowlands. Först i En kvinna under påverkan 1974. Och senare i Gloria och i premiärkvällen. When you're in this house you really see uh, what an influence your professional career has had on you. Can it be difficult to draw a line between this and your private self? We just wanted to do this thing. We wanted a certain way of life. We wanted to... We wanted to get up and really do what we wanted to do that day. Uh, we didn't want to go do something that everyone said we should do. And believe me, everyone was saying we were doing the wrong thing all of the time. But, but it, was, it was terribly satisfying. And, uh, and, and, and I think of the kids now, um, too. They were always running, you know, every time they stepped out of their their bedroom, they stepped or tripped over a cable or bumped into a camera or something. 
so that they were very easy with it. it one thing I knew when I went to New York that I did not want was a husband. Because to me, that just meant you had to give up all of those things and, you know, become a, uh, a homemaker, which I did not want to be. And so I was not looking for love. I was not looking for romance. I was avoiding it like crazy, and I was plenty mad when I saw John Cassavetes, too, because he was the best-looking man I'd ever seen in my life. And I thought, oh, my God. I, had, I got myself all this way to New York, and then he just walks in. I didn't even invite him. It was here they lived, on the top of one of Hollywood's kullar. Och det var också i just det här huset de spelade in många av sina filmer. Jenna Rowlands och John Cassavetes. Deras kärlekshistoria är unik. It didn't seem like some um, kind of exotic thing that your parents went to the studio and, and they didn't feel shut out of it. And I think they were happy with it too. Was it hard uh, to do these films that were so different from the ordinary Hollywood movie? Fairly impossible, yes. <laughs> so how did you do? Well, we, we um, had the advantage uh, that in that both of us were actors. And we, we realized right from the beginning, I mean, when, when we suggested doing middle of the night and had the script and showed it to uh, the people with money, the studios and stuff, and they, they said, who wants to see a movie about a crazy middle-aged dame. You know, who, what's, what are you talking about? I mean, they were absolutely flabbergasted that you would think that, that uh, they would want to put their money in that. 